Fresh clashes have erupted in the Tunisian capital between police and protesters, this time outside government buildings. They follow last night's street battles that left at least eight people dead in and around Tunis. Rights groups say overall some 70 people have died in nearly a month of protests over unemployment and rising prices. Tunisia's worst unrest in decades has spilt into the capital. More clashes have broken out in the city center between protesters and police. They follow violent riots on Wednesday night in and around Tunis in defiance of a dusk-to-dawn curfew. Protesters through stones and security forces responded with volleys of tear gas and reportedly even live bullets. Rights groups say several people were killed and more than 50 others wounded in the suburbs of the capital overnight. The nationwide unrest began last month over unemployment, rising food prices and corruption. They were initially sparked by the suicide of a young graduate who set himself alight in mid-December. He made the gesture to protest against the seizure by police of fruits and vegetables he sold. The latest official count for the number of civilians killed in the unrest is around 20, but rights groups say the death toll is more than three times higher than the official figure. They blame the excessive force by security forces for the high number of deaths. The UN High Commissioner has called for an independent investigation into the killings. Clearly, uh, that is a result of some of the excessive measures used, such as snipers, the indiscriminate killing. Of, uh, of peaceful protesters. As High Commissioner, I always encourage an independent investigation. It, in this case, I'm not necessarily calling for an international investigation, but that it uh, has to be independent. In an attempt to contain the unrest, President Zinal Abedin Ben Ali has sacked his interior minister who was in charge of police. He's also promised to create thousands of more jobs and has called a conference on employment next month. In addition, the president has ordered the release of some of those detained while protesting and created a committee to investigate corruption. But the opposition has dismissed the measures as too little, too late. It has reportedly called for deep constitutional reforms and the formation of a national unity government. All the while, the protests, sometimes violent, continue on the streets as the president tries to stem the tension that could bring his country to the brink. Lebanese Parliament Speaker Nabi Berri says consultations for appointing a new prime minister will begin on Monday. Berri made the comments after meeting President Michel Suleiman. Lebanon's national unity government collapsed on Wednesday after opposition parties quit the cabinet. President Suleiman has accepted Prime Minister Saad Hariri's resignation but has asked him to continue managing the country's affairs until a new cabinet is formed. The opposition party's move was in response to the government's continued cooperation with a U.S.-backed tribunal investigating the 2005 assassination of former Lebanese Prime Minister Rafik Hariri. Reports are that the tribunal plans to indict several Hezbollah members over Hariri's murder. Meanwhile, the head of Hezbollah's parliamentary bloc says opposition parties will nominate someone with a history of resistance to head Lebanon's next government. Mohamed Rat says the consultations are aimed at consolidating Lebanon against foreign interference that seeks to politicize everything in favor of Israel. Of course, in Beirut, Ali Risk tells us more about who may be a possible replacement for Lebanon's Prime Minister, Saad Hariri, and when to expect a new government. There are a, a few, about three figures, of course. As you do know, the post for Prime Minister must be a Sunni figure. There are about uh, three figures who might be possible to fill up that post. One of them may be the former Lebanese Prime Minister, Omar Karami, who is considered to be very close uh, to the resistance. In fact, some people even say this is a weak possibility, but nevertheless, it is a, it is a possibility that Saad Hadidi might be chosen once again to form a cabinet. Nobody is expecting Saad Hadidi to back down from his uh, previous stances, for example, his support for the tribunal. That means we have more political escalation in the country and more and more deeper divisions within the country. Some people even predict that the process 
of forming a new government or the next government might take many months. So what many people here are preparing themselves for is more political turmoil unless some kind of international mediation comes about. Nearly 400 people have been killed in Brazil as floods and mudslides sweep away entire neighborhoods near Rio de Janeiro. Rescue workers are searching frantically for survivors. Rivers of mud and rock have raged down the mountains situated to the north of Rio de Janeiro, flattening villages and homes in three municipalities. Bridges and roads have been destroyed and telephone services cut, making it very difficult for authorities to assess the full extent of the disaster. But what is certain is that the situation is dire. They asked us to leave our apartment, so I came to my granddaughter's house. But the walls were cracking there, too. I don't know what will become of us. Two to three weeks' worth of rain fell before dawn on Wednesday, 26 centimeters in less than 24 hours. The downpour triggered mudslides and made rivers burst their banks. The mudslides hit at around 3 a.m. Homes lost power and residents were woken by the rumbling sound of torrents of mud and water descending upon their neighborhoods. Entire families were buried by the deluge and survivors were left scrambling for safety and digging for loved ones in the dark. In Terrace Polis alone, officials say more than 150 people have been buried and 2,000 homes destroyed. Some villages haven't even been reached yet and more rain is forecast in the coming days. The government has released $467 million in emergency aid for the flood-stricken region. The health ministry says it has sent enough medication to treat 45,000 people for a month, and 800 search and rescue workers and firefighters are digging for survivors. Such disasters are not uncommon in Brazil and invariably punish the poor who live in rickety shacks on perilous hillsides the most. Meteorologists have blamed the unusual downpour on a cold front that has intensified the heavy wet season that southeastern Brazil experiences every summer. Elsewhere in the news, Australia's third largest city, Brisbane, is now a war zone after being hit by the country's worst flood in decades. Entire suburbs are now underwater after the swollen Brisbane River reached its peak in the early morning hours. Officials say the peak level is one meter lower than previously feared, but the devastation is still intense. Thousands of properties and businesses have been submerged and infrastructure has been smashed. Roads are inundated, railway lines have been cut, and sewage is spreading into the waters. The flooding, which began on Australia's northeastern state of Queensland in late November, so far has claimed 17 lives. Many more are still missing. 9.38 p.m. in Iran's capital, Tehran. This is Press TV News. Let's review the top stories. Fresh clashes erupt in Tunisia as more people are killed in anti-government protests. Lebanese parliament speaker says consultations are on appointing a new prime minister will begin on Monday. And as you just saw in Brazil, nearly 400 people are killed in flooding and mudslides.